Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Haley Pestner and I serve as a manager in the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. I will be the host of this keynote presentation with Professor Bob Dougherty, the Executive Dean for the Forbes School of Business and Technology at Ashford University, and Dr. Iris Lafferty, Executive Dean for the College of Arts and Sciences at Ashford University. Your microphones will be muted for this presentation, but I do encourage you to post questions and comments in the chat. Also keep your eye on the chat for a link to a helpful session feedback survey. Thank you. Thank you, Haley, for that introduction. And thanks to everyone for joining us today for Ashford College updates. Though this session is far more than just college updates, especially if we consider the wonderful context and action items that our keynote speaker this morning, Larry Robertson, gave us. Larry argued that keys to negotiating uncertainty and to staying resilient among challenging times are reflecting on one's own landscape and then not being afraid to experiment and be creative with what we do in that landscape. In their talk, our esteemed deans today will share their perspectives on our institutions and our faculty's current landscape and their vision for where we're going to go in the future. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bob and Iris, and thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Um, I think I'm going first, and I'm going to ask, uh, hopefully, Haley or you to uh, progress the slides. So if we no could go, go to the next slide, that would be great. Perfect, well, thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to, to be here. I uh, intend to talk a, a fair amount about the business school uh, during the Q&A portion of, uh, of the presentation, but wanted to just spend a quick eight to 10 minutes on my view of higher education and the state of the industry, if you will. And I'm using the boy who cried wolf, um, which is a fable which we all know as a metaphor for uh, a couple of points that I'd like to make. So um, as I think we all appreciate, uh, the tale concerns a shepherd boy who repeatedly uh, tricks his nearby villagers into thinking that a wolf is attacking the flock. And after repeated false alarms, uh, and when a wolf finally does appear, the boy calls for help. And the villagers, of course, don't believe him and the flock is eaten. Um, in later versions, uh, in English uh, uh, translated versions, the boy actually gets eaten as well, which I think Quentin Tarantino would, uh, would approve. But if we could move to the next slide. So how does this relate to higher education? In 2011, Harvard Business School professor Clay Christensen alarmed the academy and he made this uh, bold statement, which I'm sure everybody has seen, 50% of the 4,000 colleges and universities in the U.S. will be bankrupt in 10 to 15 years. Next slide, please. In 2017, he sounded the alarm again and doubled down on his prediction. He said, I bet that it takes nine years rather than 10 years. Sadly, Professor Christensen uh, passed away earlier this year, and so I'm not sure if he meant 10 years from 2017, so 2027, or if it was 10 years from the 2011. Uh, in any event, it was still a big, bold prediction. Next slide, please. So a lot of smart people have been making forecasts about higher education. Uh, Peter Drucker, who in the world of, of business education is a seminal thinker and contributor, in 1997, in a Forbes interview, said that 30 years from now, big universities will be relics. He didn't think they would survive, and he thought the changes that were afoot were as uh, impressive as when the printed book first happened. I'm gonna read you just two quick things he said, which uh, ring very true still to this day. Uh, from that interview, he said, do you realize that the cost of higher education has risen as fast as healthcare? Such totally uncontrollable expenditures without any visible improvement in either the content or the quality of education means that the system is rapidly becoming unattainable. Then he also cited technology. He said, already we are beginning to deliver more lectures and classes off campus via satellite or two-way video communication at a fraction of the cost. The college won't survive as a residential institution. 
Very interesting. Um, as I said, a lot of smart people make forecasts. And in that book uh, in the lower right hand corner of this slide is my favorite book ever written on forecasting by a guy named Philip Tetlock and Dan Gardner. And I cannot recommend, recommend that book highly enough. So next slide, please. So the big question is how many colleges and universities has the wolf eaten since 2011? And the answer is roughly 300. And if you really study those 300, uh, over two thirds of those are uh, for-profit institutions that suffered the slings and arrows of the Obama administration and the attack on the for-profit sector. But what's interesting is if you look at the number of students enrolled in degree granting institutions, um, you see that the population of students from 2011 to 2021 is down just over 5%. And so what, uh, in statistics, there's clearly some correlation there. It's not an R square of one, but you can see that there is a cause and effect um, that the number of students uh, in some way predict the number of degree granting institutions. Um, what's not on this slide is in 1980, the year that Iris Lafferty was born, there were 10 and a half million students in higher education, and there were roughly 2,300 institutions. So that correlation looked relatively um, similar. Next slide, please. So in statistics, it's very important to never confuse correlation and causation. As we teach in BUS 308, thank you, Ron Beach and Violota Dracopoulou for your work in revising our stats course, BUS 308. So as we appreciate as academics, correlation is a statistical technique that tells us how strongly a pair of variables are related and changed together. It does not tell us why and, how, and the how behind the relationship, but just simply that a relationship exists. Causation, of course, takes it a step further says any change in one value will cause a change in the other value. And clearly you need students to have schools. Interestingly enough, some forecasters by 2030 think that we will have 50% more students in higher ed than we, uh, than we uh, do have today. Um, so does that mean that we are going to have 50% more schools? My answer is no, I don't think so. And this headline from the New York Times, um, colleges slash budgets in the pandemic with nothing off limits, very dire language, liberal arts department, graduate student aid and so forth. Um, clearly higher education institutions are under financial uh, stress because of the pandemic. And even prior to the pandemic, sadly, there were uh, close to 800 liberal arts colleges that had less than 2000 students attending them that were also suffering uh, some uh, financial strain. So why don't I think this correlation between number of institutions and number of students is going to continue? Next slide, please. And the answer is the unicorns are coming and they are hungry and they are innovative and they have lots of money. So what is a unicorn? In Silicon Valley, a company that has a valuation greater than $1 billion is called a unicorn. And so unicorns have been changing the concept of time and place in lots of industries. As we all appreciate in retail, um, you can shop on Amazon with unlimited selection uh, versus going to your local mall where you may um, not find the store or the store may be there, but it won't have your size. And certainly has happened in entertainment where you could um, go to a movie for $15 and spend $20 on popcorn, or you could stay at home and watch a film uh, either for free or rent it for $2.99. So digital technology is upending traditional industries and education is next on its list. Next slide, please. So when you think about education technologies and, and, and unicorns, just five years ago, there were zero ed tech unicorns in the entire world. Today, there are over 30. There are 14 here in Silicon Valley, um, and there's likely more being birthed during this pandemic. What's interesting is, is during crises like these, a lot of innovative companies um, are founded. So during the Great uh, Recession of 2008, 2009, 
Uber was founded in March of 2009 when the Dow Jones hit Dow Jones hit absolute bottom of around 6,000. It's at over 25,000 today. And Airbnb was founded in August of 2008, only a few weeks before Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. So within uh, education technology, just two names and uh, of of many that will change and are changing higher education. Parchment, which I think I talked about at last year's CETL uh, conference, uh, they have uh, the ability to capture and deliver verified electronic education credentials by linking schools, universities, and their institutions. This is effectively a portable uh, transcript. Um, Guild uh, Education is a remarkable uh, platform that is uh, uh, focused on education benefits and tuition reimbursement. And they have grown from a roughly about $160 million of revenue last year to double that uh, this year. So next slide, please. So how does this impact all of us? What is often not cited in these um, dire predictions about the number of institutions is the number of faculty members. So right now there are um, roughly 2.6 million full-time faculty members in the US and just over 1 million part-time faculty members. So there's roughly 3.6 million fellow educators who are teaching at institutions, helping students earn a college degree or credential to help them improve their lives. And so my recommendation to all of us and uh, as how best can we help our students um, and the University of Arizona Global Campus and yourself are really captured in these three bullets. And, and, and one thing I would challenge you to do between this year's conference and next year's conference is set a goal for once a month, just find an ed tech company and learn something about it and integrate it into your classroom and share it across the university. It's incumbent that we all challenge each other to get better, to stay current and to never stop innovating. Next slide, please. So with that, I will make one bold prediction. By 2030, there will be over 30 million Americans who will be enrolled in a college or university course that is provided or in partnership with the unicorn. And there will be over 5 million faculty members. So 50% more than they are there are today. And my sincere hope is I hope they are as exceptional as all of you. So thank you for my intro remarks and I will hand things over to my esteemed colleague, Iris Lafferty. Thank you, Dean Doherty. Thank you for those thoughts and uh, your wise advice. I, I hope what I have as opening remarks here to our conversation is a present for the unicorn. And uh, so I, I think we, we welcome them. And I'm gonna start by first saying thank you. I'm really honored to have this time to share some thoughts regarding the Col College of Arts and Science and grateful to be in this seat to serve as Cass's inaugural Dean and happy birthday Cass, we're about a year old now. And I want to also thank the CETL team, Morgan, Teresa, Haley, the folks that uh, chase me and I, I chase them right back uh, for the support that happens not just during this conference, but for the daily work that that team um, helps to engage us and our faculty in. With that, I have to also um, bring kudos to our three department chairs and cast, Dr. Tony Farrell, Dr. Barbara Zorn Arnold and Dr. Yvonne Lozano, uh, along with the center leadership, Drs. Jen Bogle, Amy Rogers and Ming Zen Bao. The uh, leadership there is uh, the reason why I'm still able to stand uh, alongside the faculty that, that serve at our college. And to our faculty, I hope by the end of this brief presentation, I will be as brief as possible. My thoughts can be considered as an ode to the work that you do. Faculty are truly the architects of the bridge in the, in the theme that CETL has presented today in merging the classroom and the real world. In fact, CAS can only function via its 1,676 associate faculty members 
that are cared for by the CETL team. And so to the associate faculty members, Mir Miriam, I, I see you. Uh, thank you very much for your help here. And what I'd like to accomplish in these next about eight to 10 minutes as well is first of all, to level set the conversation by introducing a few trends in higher ed. And then from those trends, I'd like to share a framework that hints at where CAS has been working. Uh, think of it as an organizing tool of its recent endeavors, and then also its spaces for growth and focus as we near 2021. This is all in relation to supporting student learning and success. And then on top of that, uh, having worked closely here with our business college, I'm going to borrow a business perspective that I think as an overlay to these spaces of motivation and cog cognition, how that informs learning. I hope that that perspective will inform how faculty can contribute to these three shared areas. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is not necessarily meant to be read, but if you pluck out some of the themes um, some of the words from the, the unicorns that are coming. Um, in fact, I may have one or two quotes there, if not there in the bank that I, that I did an environmental scan of. Here are some highlights. There is learning, learning has to happen in relation to engagement, student faculty engagement. Next, degree and learning need to connect to work and the professions through competencies. And then third, catering to learners means catering to a fluidity in the generations and to different needs. And if we just think about how different our learners are from a traditional college student, think about how 89% of our students are over the age of 25. 70% of our students are employed full or part-time. 48% are first-gen college students and 51% um, report to be persons of color, 25 are active duty military or veterans. So based on these trends, I will introduce three areas again that CAS should be focused upon. They will look familiar, they're not new, but again, think of it as an organizing tool for the CAS work of current and going forward. What is important about these trends as, or rather these areas as they are bundled together they're important and relevant to our teaching and learning successes as they have strong foundations in two, in two places. One, strongly uh, foundationally set in cognitive learning theory as well as motivational theory. Next slide, please. So the first area of focus, it is important for CAS to be and to become curators of engaging and expansive learning experiences. So I know we talk about engaging learning experience and that should go ahead and fire up a number of synapses already. I will toss in the notion of expansive and save that for another time um, in terms of dialogue, but how does this happen? How is it happening and where can we grow? First of all, through connection. CAS does indeed do a good job of this right now. We have resources, classroom supports. I think of all of the YouTube channels with the center courses with ENV 111 for associate faculty members and building those discussions with ECE, uh, with the student to get centered newsletter and also with cent the center's live learning sessions. We're connected by community. We offer student welcome sessions. We have um, Facebook clubs for Latinx and psychology majors. We have book studies in the sciences. We contribute to the community scholarships through the No Excuses University efforts. And we have the health centers learning communities. In addition, how else must this happen? Through high impact practices. Um, you guys thought you didn't really want hips maybe, but hips I will argue are the best things. A description from the American Association of Colleges and Universities describe high impact practices as unusually positive benefits that accrue to students who participate in an educational practice. 
including enhanced engagement in a variety of educationally purposeful tasks, those things that gain deep and integrative learning at a high, and help higher persistence and graduation rates for students. CAS has performed an inventory of their high, um, of their high impact practices uh, based on these AAC and U descriptions. So with that inventory, now we are able to help determine the direction and the prioritization of an initiative or initiatives with which we engage. So for example, a couple of high impact practices include our first year seminars and experiences. The center does support the first year student experience in critical inquiry and in writing, for example. It also helps to promote the Ashford Humanities Review and the, um, the ASH is a peer reviewed scholarly journal of essays written by AU students. We have the Behavioral Sciences Department engaging in a psychology symposium. This year's title was Embracing Our Strengths in the Face of Challenging Times. United, we step together, step forward together. So other um, HIPs include work in diversity and global learning. And I think both uh, Dean Doherty and I will have an opportunity to go ahead and address some of the questions there. But in addition to that, we also need to in engage our students to curate learning so that we can pave through um, individualized pathways. We need to be the champion of diversity, um, the diversity of professional experiences and goals that come to us at the College of Arts and Sciences. We also need to champion the diversity of perspectives as well. Now, given all this, we, we are doing the work it's a place of growth is to refine the understanding of the student journey that we have. I, I think of the uh, graphic that Michelle Warren had created for the PhD in ed. I, I presume that that's Michelle and I'm sure um, a number of other folks on that team, but she, I saw her, her work um, in, a, in a meeting recently. And it was this amazing graphic of how a doctoral student needed to get through certain milestones in order to hit, hit their goal. And I think that's the closest we have, at least that I have seen, where we go beyond looking at the administrative aspects of a student journey, but we also include an understanding of institutional affinity, of the cognitive connection to the coursework, of anticipation of what is next, of belongingness and student ease, as in like mother ease, and how do we speak with the student to help promote their work. And in addition to that, another space of growth, and you will see this coming from the center, is the expansion of the first year engagement practices to go ahead and, and spread throughout the rest of the colleges and over um, the aisle to Forbes as well. Next slide, please. In addition to being curators of engaging learning, the second area of focus is that CAS becomes facilitators of meaningful learning. And we'll speed up a bit here. Um, it's important for CAS to be and become these facilitators of meaningful learning, meaningful learning as a formalized approach within the field of constructivism, within that theory base. So actively linking learning to previous knowledge, using the characters of uh, activity, constructivity, goal directedness, authenticity, and collaboration as meaningful learning environments when we create the spaces for those students and we can facilitate that in our coursework. Next, leaning, <laughs> leaning, learning is meaningful when it is relevant to career and professional advancement. We all know this from teaching and being with our adult learners. So here we are able to tap into our institutional strength in assessment. This framework is already here for the taking for our faculty. And um, we, but we need to carry it out through working with the ILOs and um, which already encompass the NACE competencies of career readiness. Sorry, skipping here. Um, the growth opportunity here as facilitators of meaningful learning 
is to work interdepartmentally, to chunk, to stack, to equip our students with evidence of learning and opportunities to partake of this, of, of learning of the curriculum in, in pieces and parts that make the most sense for them and their goals. Next slide, please. Okay, so the third area is the importance of being disseminators of usable knowledge. And I, I know the folks that attend um, Dr. Swenson's town hall has, has heard this before, but now contextualizing it with needing to be the curator of engaging learning, needing to be the facilitator of meaningful learning, and now taking all of that and helping to disseminate that as usable knowledge. And this, um, this description here, usable knowledge is like meaningful learning. Uh, let me see, sorry, just blanked out on me here, my screen. Usable knowledge like meaningful learning has two, its roots in learning and cognition. It is focused on problem solving and inquiry, and it is purposely meant to bridge theory and practice alike, just, just like this conference. So as a teaching institution, what I need to say about usable knowledge is that this is to me our public service. It is an educator's responsibility and a civic duty. If you have information, that information needs to be shared. Um, and by doing so, what, you, what happens then is that you feed the knowledge base into that back into the channel of what's meaningful um, and accessible for others. So for example, currently in CAS, I, I think of the blogs, John Ackerman contributed to a blog uh, for us for Constitution Day. We have a number of creative and uh, research-based research, research -based authorships, published journals, uh, Sherry Liu in, in the health uh, department and uh, you know, conference work. Think of the Dog Ate Mask webinar for parents where 1900 individuals were registered and there they gain support for their families and how to navigate the current educational environment. I could go on and on. We have an open source ed resource space. We have an ECE community channel and also the quarterly colloquium series. So growing in the near future, uh, places that we hope to engage in is to go ahead and produce podcasts that is um, on the shoulders right now of our criminal justice program folks and then also forthcoming a health webinar series on, on hope. Next slide, please, almost done. So we just briefly went over three areas of focus about engaging learning, meaningful learning, and the dissemination of usable knowledge. And what I have to share is that I attended an alumni event recently, and it was a conversation with a Dr. James Byrnes. He's an professor at MIT, and he was speaking on the topic of profitability. It was with regard to supply chain and the operations in companies. He has a, a very uh, complicated technical algorithm, but in it, what I, what I got was that he looked at the peaks and the deserts within a company. Now, if I, if I take that model very broadly and I apply it over what we have here at the college, what I see is as the peak or the peak of profit is actually a peak of gain. And I would say that, that is our, it, it is our faculty. That is where we gain. The drain in our profitability, the drain on resources is what I will call fake work. And so the goal going forward is to fully realize that faculty expertise is what needs to be overlaid and directed to the three areas that we discussed. So last slide, please. This will help to pull it all together. Um, so given the business idea of maximizing, then the question, which is that middle triangle, the, how do we maximize? Now, I know this will sound a little bit abstract. I'm trying to uh, carry on, on time here, but what I, what I see is this. 
I ask that CAS faculty absorb the identities of curator, facilitator, and disseminator. I'm working still to understand how these identities interplay with something very practical and near to us that are full-time faculty members, and that is with the Boyer's model, in which we measure and gain and take a look and analysis of faculty performance and where their bliss is, quite honestly. That's a really important part to me. So I parenthetically set those in each of the different triangles there. I open that up for future discussion. Is that where Boyer's places should be pieced and, and settled into? And I can also imagine conversations where truly the lines are blurred. At an individual level, this is what I hope also is, is a takeaway for our faculty is that we need to maximize the cognitive affordance of faculty expertise, which means that we should be functioning our, our best profit areas at a high order level of thinking skills. So where there are systems and transformations and implications and understandings and all at the upper levels of the Bloom pyramid, that is where faculty should be living and, that's, and, and, and that keeps us away from our, our fake work. And that can only happen in fruition through the collaboration and leveraging and the avoidance of, of redundancies uh, and essentially overall to go ahead and work interdepartmentally to go ahead and uh, maximize the potential that we have as a college. And, that, and that's the last slide, thanks. Thank you, Bob and Iris, for sharing your vision of the future of the colleges. We're going to dive into some of the points you made today with several questions, and we encourage everyone in the audience to post questions in the chat as well. As time allows, um, Haley and I will be able to moderate those for our speakers. The theme of TLC 2020, of course, is merging the classroom and the real world, which captures the spirit of our institution's strategic program structuring and shift to the National Association of Colleges and Employers or NACE-based institutional learning outcomes. These two things are simultaneously exciting and challenging directives. What makes you most proud about how College of Arts and Sciences and Forbes School of Business and Technology faculty and staff have addressed these, delement, have addressed these developments over the course of this year? Go ahead, Iris. I'm out of breath. <laughs> that was a lot. Would you mind repeating the question? What are you most proud of of your faculty and staff and how they addressed the challenges and changes that accompanied our shift over the past year to NACE competencies and our institutional structuring. Well, you have four hours um, because there's a lot going on. I, I, I would, I guess there's a, a, a few things. Um, we had an all college meeting on Monday and had uh, several faculty members and, and program leads share um, some new courses, uh, well, existing courses that they have built a great deal of innovation into. And so our, uh, which I think Craig highlighted this at a university-wide meeting last week, that BUS 330 won a, uh, in a deal award for excellence in distance education. It's a, it's a marketing course. Um, I actually mentioned our BUS 308 course in my, my introductory remarks. And then William Woods, um, shared at the All College Meeting OMM 695, which is a remarkable course, um, has a, um, a female CEO that um, goes through a number of different uh, interesting organizational challenges, um, and, and the student takes on that CEO role, um, and and um, and and finishes the the course in a way that captures all eight of the NACE competencies. What's interesting is, is he matched those eight NACE competencies up against the six American Management Association competencies and 
five of the six AMA competencies were were captured. One the one exception was on strategic planning and 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 um, in development, which is is not really the purpose of of the OMM six nine five course. So you know, Teresa, as I said, each and every one of our faculty who own a course um, have embraced NACE. And, and I think, you know, with the help of CETL and, and, and really with the help of, 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 of Trisha Lauer's team, um, have really, um, am very proud of, of the way the team um, jumped in to really understanding those eight competencies and making sure that they're built into the curriculum. Um, and so that, so that not only our students are being exposed to it, but our students are now aware of NACE. And so then when they're out in, in their existing jobs or looking for a new job, they can actually speak in terms of competencies, which is, uh, I think, very valuable. My response is an echo of Bob's, honestly. The pulling the NACE competencies into the ILOs and just kind of for the good of the order here, the competencies I have listed on, on a sticky right here, critical thinking, problem solving, oral and written communication, teamwork, digital technology, leadership, professionalism, career management, global uh, and intercultural fluency. Those are a responsibility now of, you know, by, by being, um, ha having collaborated with the assessment team, that is a responsibility of our faculty to prove actually that learning in those eight spaces happen because they are part of our institutional learning outcomes. I think that is an amazing, amazing institutional point of pride. And if I had to pick, because leadership is difficult to, to understand, difficult to learn. You've got a billion, of pund billion pundits uh, uh, telling you how to be a leader. Uh, but leadership, you can see it resonating through a number of the programs at, at the colleges. And then you see it in co-curricular spaces like in the round tables that the center hosts for their for honors and um, high achieving students. You see it in our collaborations from both colleges with the champs, with the champs mentoring group. So um, that's one of my favorites if, if I had to pick one and, and a, another point of pride. I hear a theme in both of your points of pride that the faculty themselves have embodied these NACE competencies in critical thinking, teamwork, problem solving, and leadership to develop wonderful new courses, student engagement opportunities. Given these points of pride, um, let's put them into the context of the next development uh, our institution is going through, which is the transition to University of Arizona Global Campus. As we transition, what do you foresee being your college's greatest challenge? Iris, do you wanna go first? Sure. Okay, and this, I want to say, I don't have data for this, but I, I am inspired by something that Dr. Lozano sent to me and it was a CBS <laughs> news piece about patience. And I believe that that will be our greatest challenge. It, it is difficult for, for folks to sit and wait and um, wait for the social unrest to quell, wait for answers for a cure and then most locally, to, to wait for unanswered questions as we turn the corner and transform um, the places that we are, that, that our identity as, as a university. I think that is the tricky part. And it's hard to put a bunch of smart people in a place and, and, and say, hold on, because immediately people will wanna find answers and, and solve problems. Yeah, I would say our biggest challenge, um, and this is, I, I think, across the university, is for the University of Arizona, uh, number one, to get to know us and, and, uh, and to really get to know us and um, to embrace that we are a teaching and learning institution. And, and teaching and learning institutions, by definition, um, 
are slightly different than tier one research institutions and just sort of the ethos that uh, permeates those institutions. And so, you know, for the business school, what I am very keen to have happen as fast as possible is for, you know, our department chairs, Jorge Cardenas and Maya Zellick and Karen Ivey and, and Katie Theory, um, to develop plans for their faculty and, and their teams to get to know the people at the University of Arizona. Um, you know, I, I, through my business career, have been involved in a great many mergers and acquisitions. And oftentimes I, I use the analogy, it's like an eighth grade dance where all the boys are on one side of the room and the girls are on the other side of the room. And at some point the music has to play and we got to get to know each other. And, and so I, I very much want the Forbes School of Business and Technology to lead and, and to uh, develop very quickly relationships at the UAGC and to um, have them get to know us because we have remarkable faculty. We have incredible curriculum um, that is truly innovative. And, and, you know, some of the things that Craig Swenson has shared, I know at university wide meetings and, and just in, in, in our own meetings about how the, the folks at Arizona are quote unquote blown away by uh, our use of technology and innovation around how do we, you know, assess learning and, and so forth. So um, I could go on and on, but hopefully that gives you some sense, Teresa. Yes, and um, as a follow-up sort of combo question, if our institution's challenges are, you know, trying to face that drive to just jump in and solve problems right away, um, and to get another institution to understand us, what do you believe are our faculty's greatest strengths that will allow us to meet these challenges? Or what um, ideas or approaches would you like our faculty and staff to take as we try to meet these challenges? Do you want me to go first, Iris? Okay. Um, well, and, and uh, I think somebody put in the chat while Iris was speaking about theory plus practice equals the right formula. And, and I think that was on one of Iris's slides. Our greatest strengths uh, within the business school, I know across the institution is, uh, and I'll just speak for the business school, is that we're, we're academic practitioners. So we truly have people that understand the theory um, behind the discipline that they're teaching. So Don Fry in accounting, I would put Don Fry up against any accounting professor at any institution in the United States. I don't say that lightly because he comes from having been, he was the CFO of a university. His career trajectory is remarkable. And we're blessed with, with a lot of uh, faculty members who are at a point in their lives and their career that they wanna give back. And so they come to us with 20, 30 years of real world practical experience. And that's very different than the, you know, the super smart 22 year old that goes right into a PhD program and is at 35 suddenly teaching sections of, of courses. And they're more interested in themselves than they are their students. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. We were all sort of self-centered at some point in our career so we could move ahead. But I, I, I feel great about Ashford's uh, faculty in, in terms of just being, you know, focused on, on caring about the student to make sure. And, and, you know, there's an old cliche, as soon as the student knows that, you'll, that you care, they will care what you know. But until they know that you actually care about them, they don't bloody well, in most instances, bloody well care what credentials you have or um, what you're opining on, so. I think what I, I follow up on that, and this this may may lead to some, um, I may be skipping ahead here, Teresa, but I think about the the perspective that our, our faculty should have as as we as we go forward, and there is something called terror management theory, and that's not <laughs> that's not what I'm 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 suggesting, but the funny thing is from from terror management theory. The true outcome of that is that when people think about their place in, their, in the world during times of duress, and duress could be 
there's a lot of stress. I have homework. I've got, you know, three kids in the, in the back and I still have to get up and go to work early and everything is due and, and whatever, or dress in terms of the world where it is, um, is, is aching, right? But what happens there is that uh, the thoughts, the thoughts that emerge from that terror or the duress or that stress emerge as uh, it's manifest into instead pro-social motivation. And so what I hope that our faculty carry forward is a pro-social motivation to contribute continuously to the field, to help multiply others and to build forward um, kind of that hopefulness, but hopefulness as, as more than a pat on the back, a hopefulness that's anchored in, in, in something concrete that folks can walk forward to their work, to their families with, you know, that helps. Both of your comments are beautiful segues into the topic of faculty professional development um, because the work of both Cass and Forbes this year in conjunction with the CEDL on developing learning opportunities for faculty has been on showing care for students and also showing um, direct impact on one's field at the same time. Um, and we've done that together through the 2020 quarterly colloquium series. Um, so I'm hoping each of you can speak a bit more about your college's colloquia. Um, for example, what were some of the main motivations or themes behind the presentations that faculty from your college gave? Um, how successfully did these presentations connect discipline specific information to instructional practice? And what do you hope to achieve from colloquia moving forward in 2021? Iris, do you want to go first? Sure, it feels a little bit like a Miss America <laughs> question. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> let me remember all of those, those pieces. World peace. Uh, <laughs> world peace, yes, thank you. <laughs> I watched Miss Congeniality. Um, no, I, I appreciate that question. The colloquium series, that was a vision carried out by CETL, helped to come to fruition by the faculty, but it was, it was Dr. Swenson, our, our president's vision. He, I, I'm, I'm recalling this, he really wanted to say, how can we bring what we know and, and bring it out there? What do we need to do to do that? And, and so, you know, here it is, the colloquium series. And for Cass, you know, the, the most emergent theme to me is what Gilligan in the 1970s, um, the psychologist, not the character on an island stranded, <laughs> talked about as a, as a care voice. But it, if you think of the organization as a human and the human exuding care and connectivity, we went through to begin with, um, again, faculty expertise is, is incredible. We had our Dr. Charles Holmes um, leading the MPH program, the Masters in Public Health. And he came when we really needed him to talk about COVID-19. And the funny thing is, you know, nowadays we kind of just say COVID, it's, it's been but a few months, but nobody really says COVID-19. And I look back at that title, reflect back at that. We called it COVID-19. Um, in, its, in its formality, we then moved to, uh, to examine uh, learning met from men of color. And that's Dr. Newton Miller's work on constructing culturally responsive academic and student service systems. So that pivoted us more um, you know, from a, another practical space of in the home to in the classroom. We carried that out with another lens of diversity from our Dr. Yvonne Lozano, who is department chair at health. And she spoke to multi-generation, multi-general, gener, I'm not gonna be able to say that, multi-generational, I got it, <laughs> diversity. And something that we don't always wear as a lens, but as our diverse students continue you know, with us, what is it that we are not talking about? What are we presenting to them um, that is not honoring their space? And then we went, um, most recently, we have our associate faculty members speaking to motivating the online learner 
And uh, next week, Dr. Catherine Sellers on an action plan for fa faculty and self wellness. So kind of us in a nutshell, what we, what we care about at CAS. Yeah, that is, there, there was a lot of items in that question, um, but I, I do, I, I wanna make a couple of points. First, I wanna give a shout out to Gloria Zuniga y Postigo, who did a colloquial on um, ethics and she is truly an expert in critical thinking. And so, you know, and how she correlated concepts of compliance. Um, I, I truly encourage everybody to, to go back and if you're a podcast uh, aficionado like I am to just load that up and, and you're trying to get your 10,000 steps in and, and listen to that, it's really, it's really terrific. Um, I, you know, and I applaud CETL for enabling all of these colloquium. Um, I, I would really want to challenge, um, and I, I just want to highlight also, uh, Jim Jeremiah also did a phenomenal colloquium on leadership. And in both those topics, ethics and leadership during this past year, maybe during these past four years are, are subjects that I think we all appreciate that uh, were more widely distributed. Um, but, uh, but really challenge our faculty members to challenge us to help them get their, um, their expertise out beyond the classroom. And, and how do we not only share amongst, you know, the academy within our own colleagues, among our own colleagues, which is just fantastic. Um, one of the great reasons I'd love to work at a university is to to hear from all these other smart people who are incredibly stimulating and, and knowledgeable, but um, it is to is to take it beyond just us and and our students, but more broadly across society. And I know that's Craig Craig Swenson's vision as well. So, in the realm of taking expertise, you know, beyond the classroom and bringing it to students, colleagues, staff, and our wider communities. Um, of course, we have to consider the public health, social, and cultural upheaval that we've been experiencing through this past year. This highlights the continued need for diversity, equity, inclusion, or DEI development among our faculty, staff, and students. And so I'm hoping you each can share about your college's goals for championing DEI related work in this next year. Teresa, if I, if I may, uh, and also thank you, Teresa, is part of the change advisory group that uh, is, you know, that Dr. Swenson um, leads. And I want to say that the DEI work cannot be owned necessarily by just by just the college because it needs to be pervasive across across academics and, and across all aspects of, of the university. And if I if I may, I'd like to share a little bit of the work that that CAG, the Change Advisory Group, has done. And one is one is they have taken the um, the threat of whatever has been plaguing us as a social and justice and unjust space and provided us a place to gather, to converse, to listen to a panel, and then to come back and discuss with more uh, personal relevance what that means to us. And that is the turn the tide um, conversation. So that's one thing that I, I think is a winning aspect of how we've worked to um, do diversity, equity, and inclusion. Secondly, the, the CAG group has pushed out a message of hope. And while it seems, you know, at some level you could say the, those are those are words, what is what does it mean? That message of hope was a heartfelt statement to be applicable to what what pangs um, our students, our, our faculty, our associate faculty, our institution was feeling. It was a, a pull toward positivism in, in, um, in regard for, the, for another human. And upcoming, we also have the diversity and equity and inclusion statement that's um, being looked at, at at the executive level. So those are, those seem small, but it is 
in the forefront of our minds, we have a space to talk about um, equity and inclusion. The more concrete piece that, that our teams will probably see is the development of the equity rubric. And that is um, from the, the respective hands of um, John Bathke from Forbes. And I'm gonna miss some people, I'm gonna be so sorry. I wanna say Don, Don Fry from, from Forbes as well. Um, Michelle over at uh, Majors at, at CAS. And we have an associate faculty member, somebody, I believe Miriam. So sorry, I didn't write everybody's names down. Um, but also, I mean, these are the folks and Yolanda Harper have led to develop a rubric that will be applied to each and every program and uh, it will serve as a lens for inclusion. And I think that is the nice concrete work that we can all look forward to and, and be proud of. And I know there are other pieces of work that, that happen um, in a more grassroots way across the institution and um, in different departments. Yeah, I would, I would echo all that Iris has just shared because it, it's really been a cross college exercise. Um, the, the whole DEI um, approach to things, which I'm, again, I'm, I'm very proud of that. It's a remarkable time uh, as we all appreciate in our history. And, you know, Melinda Gates oftentimes says that, you know, you hear about problems because they're urgent, but you don't hear about progress because it takes a lot of time. And, I, and, and this may be slightly controversial. I would say that Ashford over the last 10 years, if you, if you look at the, the composition of our faculty to where, where it was 10 years ago to where it is today, not perfect, my goodness, it's not perfect, but um, it's gotten a lot better. Um, but, you know, and in, in when I look at just the number of African-American women who are within the course of business and technology, and we don't have enough African-American women represented, just full stop. And so we need to be proactive in finding qualified candidates um, to, to help our students. Um, and we'll, I guess, talk about this at the Center for Women's Leadership tomorrow. But, you know, we, we have all benefited from having role models. And, and we need our faculty members to be role models to our students. And, and, uh, and so uh, I, I applaud Iris's leadership because she's really um, you know, answered Craig Swenson's call and, and has led a lot of this uh, across both colleges. Teresa, I, I, I think one of the outcomes of all of that work is that I would consider it a responsibility. It is educational malpractice. I will go as far to say that. If we graduate students without offering them an opportunity to see the world from a broader lens from which they entered. And so that, that goal, that driving work is, is what really, I, you know, pumps the, the um, work on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And toward that goal in the last couple of minutes of our time today, would each of you like to share any examples of programmatic updates or innovative, innovative initiatives um, that are going on in your colleges this year? Iris, go first. What? I would, I will jump in then. Uh, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. And I want to give two shout outs to two people. One is Michael Hayden. Um, and in with the, within our Department of Tech Studies, um, Michael came into our university with a real boldness to impact change. And I wish every one of our new faculty members um, came in with the same um, desire and, and just ability to create an esprit de corps. And so he helped introduce the new aviation uh, knowledge management uh, program. Um, he has, has done a number of different things. He just co-chaired our, our thought leader summit and he led our, our youth thought leader summit. And then I want to give a special shout out to Leah Westerman, who continues within our, our uh, Masters of Human Resource and, and um, BA in HR management. They've done a number of just terrific things, uh, marrying 
programs with industry standards and in corporate partnerships that um, both of them are, are outstanding and all of our faculty are great. But, uh, as it relates to program innovation, I just wanted to highlight those two. I'm gonna tip my hat to the entire uh, body of faculty that contribute to the doctoral programs. That has come a long way and a number of the, uh, the needs there have been operationalized, but it's, it's really in the relationship with the student, the relationship with the chairs and training there that has made the difference. And we have InRes next week that's run by um, Dr. Irene Stein and supported by CETL. So I will leave it at, at that. And I'm just, again, tipping my hat to those, to those doctoral faculty members. So thank you.